Today we're going to talk about responding to the new atheists. Um, our, as a class in apologetics, of course, our focus is responding, as Peter said, to always be prepared to give an explanation for the faith that is in us. And so that's exactly what apologetics is. It's gotten, a, you know, the, the um, stakes have changed a little bit on this topic just in the last 20 years, and especially in the last dozen years, uh, because of the rise of something that is known as new atheists, or the new atheism. And we're going to talk about that today. Who, who the primary representatives are, the four, four men who are called the four horsemen of the non-apocalypse, since they don't believe in the apocalypse, um, and some of what they believe, and very generally, referring back to the things we've studied over the last um, seven weeks, how do we respond to those sorts of things? Because you will run into people um, who have read some of these books, who have been influenced by the writings of a Richard Dawkins or a Christopher Hitchens, etc. And you at least need to know who they are, what the primary premises are, and ideally you need to be prepared to respond to that. If somebody says, well, yes, but Richard Dawkins says, you need to have some idea, based on everything we've been studying over the last seven weeks, how you might respond to it. So, um, again, today is responding to the new atheists. Next week, first hour, we will de de do applying the principles, how we do apologetics in a modern world. We'll get into that a little bit today because of the topic. But then the final exam. I do encourage you all, study and take the final exam, and uh, you'll learn the material a lot better. And I say that, I'm going to say that every time we approach final exam in, in all of the courses we do. So I think that looks all right, doesn't it? Okay, good. <laughs> I was a little worried about you. I'm, I tried calling. Okay, so um, the new atheism. A definition would be, it's a late 20th, early 21st century social and political movement in favor, favor of atheism and secularism, marked by an aggressive attitude advocating the belief that, and this is a quote here from uh, a, an article written by someone for CNN, <laughs> just reviewing the New Atheism, and the quote was, Relig uh, the New atheists advocate that religion should not be simply should not simply be tolerated, but should be countered, criticized, and exposed by rational argument wherever its influence arises. New atheism is not really new in terms of what it espouses, but there are two parts of it that are new. And first is it is not just atheism; it is anti-theism. They are aggressive, even militant in fighting against religious belief, particularly monotheistic belief. It's not just Christianity. Um, they have been, in fact, the whole thing, the whole history of the New Atheist Movement sort of started after 9-11 uh, by Sam Harris, who we'll talk about, who wrote a book called The End of Faith. And it was a response to the attack on New York City and uh, Washington, D.C., and the idea that, that he, said it was the religion of Islam that caused that. And in fact, he used Islam as an example of all the monotheistic religions. And that was the first bestseller that came out of this. The two things that are different, one is they are militantly anti-religious and very strong in their advocate, uh, advocating of doing away with religion, of, of not being tolerant. And I'll give you a quote later. Uh, they're, they're against tolerance for people of religious beliefs. And secondly, the second thing that's new about them is they've been writing bestsellers. Major publishing houses have published their books. Daniel Dennett's, uh, I'm sorry, um, Richard Dawkins' The God Delusion has sold, as of 2010, it had sold over 2 million copies. Um, the End of Faith, the first book that sort of launched this by Sam Harris, so has sold over 500,000 copies. And so these books are bestsellers. People are reading them. So the thing that makes this new is not what they espouse as beliefs, but the fact that they are militantly anti-religious and not just saying, hey, I don't believe if you want to, fine, which has been the historic thing. And they are writing best-selling books so that their influence is spreading more widely. Um, many, many people think that they're really, really smart guys, and they, they're not so much. I mean, in, in their areas of expertise, they have, you know, like Richard Dawkins is a professor at Oxford. You don't get to be a full professor at Oxford without having some brains. But he, when he dabbles into things that are not part of his area of discipline, he's actually a, a, a biologist, an evolutionary biologist. When he starts trying to be a philosopher, 
um, people are quick to say, you know, you really ought to stick to your stuff because you don't know what you're talking about when you get into this. In fact, there's only one of these that is truly a philosopher, Daniel Dennett. Um, we'll, we'll, I'm going to introduce you to them more specifically later. So, new atheism is not new except in its militant anti-faith approach. And secondly, they, they write best-selling books. In fact, the history of it could be, even though it started back in the late 20th century, and there was some things being done, uh, Richard Dawkins was writing some, but no bestsellers. The thing that really launched this as a recognized movement was in 2004, Sam Harris, two of these people we're going to be talking about are English, two of them are Americans. Sam Harris, an American uh, writer, published a book called The End of Faith, Religion, Terror, and the End of Reason. This was in response to the 9-11 attacks. Um, it became a bestseller. It was followed by Dawkins's most popular book, Richard Dawkins' most popular book, The God Delusion, two years later. In that same year, Daniel Dennett wrote a book called Breaking the Spell, uh, having to do with the end of religious belief. And then in 2007, another very popular book by Christopher Hitchens is God is Not Great. And, uh, there are longer titles. And the, uh, the idea, uh, the time Hitchens' book, God is Not Great, is that religion is responsible for all of the suffering and evil in the world. And so it's not a good thing. Um, so this is what we're dealing with. Sometimes I want to say too many things at once, and it just doesn't all come out. <laughs> um, so what do they believe? What are the primary arguments of the new atheists? And it, th these won't shock you. They're, again, their beliefs are not new, just their militancy and the fact they write bestsellers. First. The new atheists believe that science is capable of investigating some, if not all, supernatural claims, and that the God hypothesis, they put quotes around it, can be scientifically tested, and that if it is scientifically tested, it fails any such tests. They will say, for instance, that any of the, the miracles that Christianity claims, uh, that they can be empirically tested. Now, how you empirically test something 2,000 years later is a little more difficult to say. Some of their logic does not always hold. But they claim that anything that religion states that exists in reality ought to be able to be tested by empirical means. Uh, that's one of the criticisms of them has been that they fundamentally misunderstand what theological uh, presuppositions are. And that by definition, those things are not empirical, right? That you, you can't go into a laboratory and measure the, the nature of theological belief or moral values or any of, the, any of the things we've talked about. I'm going to give you a list of some of those later. But they believe everything is empirically testable, including religious beliefs, supernatural claims. In that regard, they are going back to the logical positivists, which we've talked about, the people who um, claimed that nothing could be believed unless it could be empirically tested. And that was their, you know, their absolute principle. Well, the problem is that absolute principle is not empirically testable, which is one of the things that is a problem with the new atheism, is that they claim that everything has to be verifiable and subject to the principle of falsification. If you were in philosophy class last term, you'll know what the principle of falsification is, that you can prove it, you know, that you can claim it is false and then either find proof that it is false or find that you can't prove it's false. And if you can't prove it's false, then it must be true. All right? They sort of back into it. Yeah. But this claim that, um, that everything is empirically verifiable is not itself empirically verifiable. That's the same problem that the logical positivists ran into. And yet, they just sort of skip over that. And when people point it out, they just talk over it. So that's one thing. They believe that science is the answer to everything. And that everything can be evaluated by science. And when you do that, the God hypothesis fails. Secondly, they claim, well, Backwards. They claim that naturalism, that is that all things have a natural explanation, in other words, the absence of any supernatural. There are, there are no miracles, there is no raising somebody from the dead, resurrection, walking on water, anything. There is no event that is not naturally explainable. So, they claim that naturalism is sufficient to explain everything that we observe in the universe. If it's not, then it didn't really happen. Uh, from distant galaxies to the origin of life, and even the inner workings of the brain and consciousness. Things that science has for a long time said, we don't really know how the brain works. We don't really know how a lot of this stuff works. They, the new atheists, are 
jumping ahead and saying, we know how everything works, and if we don't, we will soon. We'll get there, that there is natural explanations for everything. We'll talk about where, how we respond to these later. Third, they argue that it is unnecessary to introduce God with a supernatural to explain reality, or to understand reality. They feel naturalism, science, scientific, scientism, are completely sufficient. Nothing is, exists that requires that we have a supernatural expectation, all right? Then, they disagree with Stephen Jay Gould. Stephen Jay Gould was a science professor, uh, actually a colleague at Oxford of uh, Richard Dawkins for a while. And in trying to identify how religion and science should coexist, and again, until the new atheists, people were prepared to try to find ways for things to coexist. Stephen Jay Gould uh, recommended that we see science and religion as um, non intersecting magisteria, uh, or non overlapping magisteria. Magisteria is an area of authority. What, he, what Stephen Jay Gould was saying is religion has its area that it speaks to, science has its area, and the two should not be expected to intersect. Now that's not something that we as Christians necessarily would agree with because we believe that science and religion are not inherently contradictory as if you have a reasonable openness to the fact that God could exist and that miracles can happen. We don't have to reject science. All truth is God's truth. And yet Stephen Jay Gould said, let's look at the science and religion as being non-overlapping magisteria. They have their own areas of influence and let's not expect them to get together. Well. The New Atheists completely disagree with Stephen Jay Gould because they say religion doesn't have a right to say things that cannot be proven. And so therefore, we're going to try to obliterate religion and only have science. So they're not prepared to even allow that religion has a legitimate place. That's part of the new thing. And in doing so, Stephen Jay Gould, in presenting the, the it's called NOMA, non-overlapping magisteria, this idea was one way in which people, prior to the New Atheists, thought, well, we can all get along. You know, because I have my area as a theologian, you have your area as a scientist, let's just not fight each other, let's deal in our own areas. New Atheists are not prepared to let that go. They then accuse religious beliefs and religious believers of being irrational. And they claim that, again, the, the God is not great book by Hitchens, they claim that religion has been responsible for much of the suffering and evil in the world. That it is not good, it is not even neutral, it is actually a negative and should be gotten rid of. Then they seek to politically reduce the influence of religion, especially in the United States, to promote mainstream acceptance of atheism and promote an atheist identity. I'm going to make sure you guys can all see this. Um, they often will compare atheists to feminists or to people of racial minority, saying they are an oppressed minority. The majority of people in the Western world are religious people of one kind or another. And they say that atheists do not have the freedom to come out. In fact, they, following the uh, gay and lesbian movement, they have campaigns. Um, Dawkins led a campaign in Britain called the Out Campaign where he was encouraging people to come out as atheists. Now, people who are minorities who really have suffered oppression are not too keen on that idea that, that somebody who's an atheist equates themselves as being oppressed in the same way that a minority is. But the new atheists have succeeded in offending almost everybody in one way or another. And so they, uh, you know, they claim, and there are huge campaigns, they are active politically, um, in fact, Dennett has a, he created a foundation for clergy who have left the ministry because they decided they were atheists or, and he's more concerned even, with clergy who are still in ministry and are closet atheists but don't admit it because they don't want to lose their jobs. So that, that's a really bad reason to keep a job when you completely dis disbelieve the foundation of it, but you don't want to lose your job or your housing allowance. And yet, Dennett created a foundation to help those people because he believes that an enormous number of ministers and religious people really are atheists, and, and they simply don't have the freedom in our society, to Western society, to be open about that. Okay? 
we would not agree with that. There are other, um, other, the four I keep mentioning are not the only ones. There are others. Stinger is another, another major one. Stinger has written a book um, called The Failed Hypothesis in, when he would, in which he tries to logically argue that a God who is omniscient, omnibenevolent, and omnipotent, or what he calls the three O God, cannot logically exist, that those things are inherently uh, incompatible. Remember when we talked about evil and the existence of evil? The argument that how can God be um, all-loving, all-powerful, and all-good, and yet there's still evil and suffering in the world? That's basically, he's just reiterated all of that argument in this book and claims that it, he considers it conclusive. Well, he hasn't read the literature. Um, questions about any of this? Where we are so far? You see where they're going. Yes, Pam. You talked about everyone um, always having or even being born with this thought of moral or something right and wrong. Right. How did they explain that? And that's one of the things that they have spent the most effort trying to explain. And both, first Sam Harris, um, in a book called The Moral something or other, um, one of his three, he's got three primary books that Harris has written, and one of them has to do with the fact he believes he has been able to explain how morality is a product of evolution. Now, he goes back to the same thing, and we've talked about this. Again, all truth is God's truth. We're, we're not trying to hide anything. He goes back to the idea that it ultimately is to the benefit of a person and to a species to have a moral approach. He does not, I believe, effectively deal with the fact that people will sacrifice themselves, that people will do things for what is seen as good, which seem to be exactly contrary to survival, self-survival or even survival of the species. Um, in terms of the Dawkins, as an evolutionary biologist, Dawkins created, he became first well-known uh, quite a few years ago by coming up with a theory of gene-driven evolution, that the gene, each gene in a person, you know, that is the, the DNA gene kind of thing, that, that each gene has a drive to, to not only survive, but to replicate. And that the, there is an evolutionary desire at the gene level that causes people to, that causes evolution to happen. Um, the fact that he has sort of imbued genes with consciousness, people seem to just sort of look over that. And, you know, um, but they do. Then as an extension of that, he came up with a theory of social mores and values, which he called memes, that, uh, that individuals will come up with these sort of social beliefs that he called memes. And he believes that those social beliefs replicate to other people, that they can literally jump the social values that a person develops, whether they're true or not, can jump to another person. And they can take on your social values, and that's how religion is passed on. And in fact, he says, he hasn't dealt as much with the moral issue as Sam Harris and Dennett have, but he says that that's the reason that people develop belief systems, they, they believe in doing good instead of evil, because they have caught <laughs> Almost like it was a disease. They caught these means of social interaction. So they've tried to explain it. Most people who have looked at that critically go, you know, this you're making stuff up now. <laughs> MSU, making stuff up. There's no indication. I mean, he hasn't been able to identify particular ways, Dawkins, that genes have demonstrated any sort of conscious or even you know, subconscious desire to replicate and excel and to create and to drive the evolutionary process, although he is very popular for that, and has, you know, that's, that was responsible for him getting all the recognition. He's the head of the, the Institute for the Understanding of Science at Oxford and other kinds of positions like that. And that's what made him famous. Nor has he ever been able to say, this is what a meme looks like. This is what it's made of. This is how it's transferred. It, it's, it's sort of like people who explain the creation as being, you know, how did everything, all the fine-tuning, how did everything happen in the universe that's exactly fine-tuned for life to exist? And they say, somebody came up with a theory that, well, maybe there are multiple universes. The, the 
mini-world or multiverse theory. There is no evidence for that. It's very convenient because it prevents them from having to accept that there, uh, there is intentionality behind the way that the universe is created, but there is no evidence for it. It is a convenient way of trying to explain a couple of things that have been observed and not, not understood in, uh, in quantum mechanics, but theologians who with a scientific, back, scientific background have been able to give just as solid an explanation for those things. The whole multiverse is just made up. As far as I can tell, and I do not claim to be an expert on the writing. I mean, I, in fact, I, in, in preparing for this, I was thinking, you know, I need to spend talk, more time with the original writings that they did. I, I need to read some more of their work. Um, I don't see how meme is anything other than something that he made up. That there, I can't see any evidence for it. And I can't, I don't know anybody else who's quoted any evidence for it, but I confess I need to get more into his original stuff and read more about what he says. But some of his stuff is very technical on that level. So, him being Dawkins. Dawkins is probably the most virulently anti-religious. You know, he has said, um, and I'll give you a quote, he has said, I do everything in my power to warn people against faith itself. He, I knew a woman in Seattle whose daughter was in one of his courses, had to take one of his courses at Oxford. And she said, if you say anything about, she was a Christian, about faith, being Christian, if you write anything that does not agree with him in any documents, he will fail you. You know, and professors at Oxford, when you get to that level, you pretty much rule your world. People don't challenge you. Uh, it's like being captain of a nuclear submarine. You ultimately have the decision to make, you know, to do whatever you want. So the power to do whatever you want. So he is virulent. In, in, in militant against any sort of religious expression like that. In fact, here's a quote. This is from, there's a website called new, newatheist.org. And this is a quote from that. Tolerance of pervasive myth and superstition, which they mean religion, in modern society is not a virtue. Religious fundamentalism has gone mainstream and its toll on education, science, and social progress is disheartening. Wake up, people. They, the two exclamation points are theirs. I didn't add anything to this. We are smart enough now to kill our invisible gods and oppressive beliefs. It is the responsibility of the educated to educate the uneducated, lest we fall prey to the tyranny of ignorance. In other words, it is a call to arms to, to actively oppose anyone who has religious belief. Yes? Another question. Most... I would think most uneducated people aren't the ones running out trying to buy these books. No. So who who is really jump? Is it the youth that's jumping on board this, or who's well, jumping? Who's who's? I can't imagine uneducated people that really buying these. Well, books. some of the, these are more popular. I mean, the, like the God Delusion, his book is not where he introduced the whole thing about the you know the evolutionary gene theory and the memes and all that. That's sort of background, but that's much more technical. The God Delusion, um, Dawkins' most popular book, is, is meant for lay people. And it's, it, I think it's especially meant for people who think they're smart. <laughs> Meaning, you know, they're, they're, they consider themselves a notch above people who believe this stuff. Perhaps they have not been exposed to people of faith who do use their brains, who are smart. Um, the fact is that we've got 2,000 years of Christian, Christian thinking, deep Christian thinking and understanding, and this has all happened in the last dozen to 20 years. And yet, some people think, oh, these guys have got it all figured out. Um, they don't, and there are a lot of people who oppose them. But they're out there, they're being very loud and proud about not believing in God and trying to get everybody else to throw them away too. Now, they are especially popular in... Um, Europe. Dawkins and Hitchens, Hitchens died in 2011, very popular in Britain, which Britain and Western Europe, although Britain is having a sort of Christian revival. In fact, uh, there's, there's a significant rise in Christianity. Um, there's a greater rise in Islam. Most of that is because of birth rates and because of, of uh, immigration. But the fastest growing movement in Britain right now is atheism significantly because of these guys. And again, Dawkins and Hitchens, two of the most articulate, are British. Dawkins is the 
loudest, most visible of all of them. Hitchens is not very loud or visible anymore because he died in 2011. But he was, he was one of the most visible because he was a well-known journalist. And he's the kind of guy they would get on all the talk shows. Um, so the US people have picked it up as well. Sam Harris and Daniel Dennett are both Americans, but not as popular as Dawkins and Hitchens. Um, and so, yeah, people read this stuff. People who think they're thinking people, but have not really ex been exposed to the other side, and they buy into this. Uh, Dawkins's book, The God Delusion, not only sold two million copies, has been translated into 31 languages. Hi. Yeah? Um, just through this conversation, I'm remembering uh, a speech the Queen made uh, within recent months. Uh, I can't remember why she made the speech, but in the speech was a fine testimony of her Christian faith and how it had pulled her through all the tragedies in her life. And uh, I thought at the time, why are we having this statement at this particular mm -hmm. time? Because although head of the Anglican Church, she's never mentioned religion. Uh, and and she's the nominal head, which yeah. means by in name only, really. Right, yeah. right. But um, it just seemed to me to click in, this is the reason why. Well, you know, it has, as I say, is growing now. It's been it's been two generations probably since sometime not too long after the Second World War that Christianity has been in sharp decline in Britain. Um, this is just giving this is articulating it in a much more militant way, best selling books, etc. But it's been happening. These guys have just poured gas on the fire. That's what it amounts to. But again, um, there is no room for. Christians to, to not have hope in this sort of thing, there is also an increase in Christianity now, uh, evangelical Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some significant churches in Britain that are, are growing and spreading and planting other churches. So there's some exciting things too. So let me talk, I, I keep mentioning these four people. Let me talk a little bit more about them and uh, their background, etc. because this is who you run into when you start talking about this stuff. First and foremost, Richard Dawkins. He is English ethnologist, evolutionary biologist, known for the gene-centered view of evolution, which I just described to you. Um, he started out, his, the first book that made him famous was The Selfish Gene, this idea that genes actually are, each gene has a drive to evolutionary development and replication, etc., and that therefore evolution is based on a genetic level more so than a species level. You remember that, that Darwin's book, The Origin of Species, the idea was that speciation, the creation of new species from previous species, was the, the thing that drove evolution. Well, Dawkins has pulled it back to the gene level. Um, not that he would disagree. None of these guys would disagree with Darwin. In fact, uh, Dawkins would, uh, would say that he, when he was introduced to Darwin as a young man, he, that's what caused him to be an atheist. He actually been confirmed as a very young person in the Church of England. So, uh, Dawkins, he wrote the book The Selfish Gene in 1976. In 1982, he wrote The Extended Phenotype, um, in which he, he talked about the ability of genes to go beyond what we might expect. Um, he, in 1986, this is, you know, this is before the thing really caught fire, but in 1986 he wrote a book called The Blind Watchmaker. Now, you remember the, the teleological explanation, the, the explanation from design, the analogy of the watchmaker from, from um, Paley, particularly Paley, uh, 19th century minister in Britain. But others have written much on the design theory, and the watchmaker analogy is that if you find a watch, it is only reasonable to believe that there is a watchmaker. It did not happen by accident. Similarly, the world, the, the world as we know it, is much more complex than a watch. It may not seem that way, but it is. All of the systems, everything that fits together, much more complex. And so how can we assume that a watchmaker demands, a watch demands a watchmaker without believing that a created world requires a creator? Well, um, Dawkins took that on in his book in 1986, The Blind Watchmaker, because he basically said evolution, non-personal evolution as a process, did all this. That's the watchmaker, and it's a blind watchmaker. It's, a, it's entirely the evolutionary process. And so, but again, people 
people on our side of the uh, discussion don't think he made, made, he really makes his argument. He simply said, oh, well, all of the compl uh, complicated stuff is all explainable by evolution. You know, and you sort of go, are, are you really looking at it? <laughs> really? So, Blind Watchmaker, and then in 2006, once Harris had gotten things really rolling with Beth Sellers starting in 2004, with The End of Faith, 2006, Dawkins wrote The God Delusion. As I say, as of January 2010, more than 2 million copies in 31 languages. Um, he is an adamant opponent of any kind of creationism. And for a while, early on, he was involved in debates with young Earth creationists. Um, it sort of grieves me that people think that is the representation of all Christian ideas about God's creation. But, the idea that the earth is only 6,000 years old. After a while, he stopped doing that because he, he had been told by Stephen Jay Gould, when Gould was still alive, don't debate with these guys because they don't even care if they lose, these creationists, they don't care if they lose in debate. All they want is what Gould called the oxygen that comes from recognition. And that, that you have a responsibility not to engage with them because in doing so, just engaging with them gives them some kind of credibility. So Dawkins will, not, will no longer be involved in, in any kind of debate like that. Um, which ends up being convenient for Dawkins. I mean, he has, some of these guys have, like Hitchens, debated a lot. He was known as a debater. He debated some quality people like William Lane Craig. Um, Hitchens had a, a long, like several night series of debates with uh, Tony Blair, former Prime Minister of England, who had converted to Catholicism. And Blair was arguing for the Christian faith side, and that, that Christianity, the real theme was Christianity is good, and Hitchens was arguing that it's not. But all of these guys have been encouraged to do documentaries uh, on the BBC, and Hitchens did a series called, Is Christianity Good? And Dawkins did one called, The Root of All Evil. And all of it's pointed toward the fact that, that the monotheistic religions, and they, they often talk about all three of them, the Abrahamic religions, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all of them as being the source, they believe, of suffering and evil in the world. Now, with completely discounting the fact that Christianity invented public hospitals and invented public orphanages and invented public schools. Now, when I say public, I mean Judaism, for instance, had free schools and things before that, but they were only for Jewish kids. Christian church in, in Europe created the idea that it didn't matter where you were coming from, what religion you were, whether you agreed with us, you can come to school, you can get treated in a hospital, etc. Right? So, uh, they just slide right over that stuff. And well, they debate it, because obviously there are people who disagree with that. Um, in Darwin's lifetime, and immediately after Darwin's life, T.H. Uh, Huxley, an ancestor of Aldous Huxley, you know, 1984 and all that, T.H. Uh, Huxley was such an adamant advocate for Darwin's theories, he became known as Darwin's bulldog. Because he's the one that was really arguing this stuff. And in fact, it was Huxley that really drew some of the sort of natural conclusions about eugenics and that you know we need to control who has babies, you know if they're not if they're not good enough people and a lot of the things that we sort of got rid of after Hitler because <laughs> Hitler and Stalin were both involved in that, especially Hitler, and so that lost lost credence with people. But T. H. Huxley was one of the ones who drew the natural conclusion, the survival of the fittest, whereas. Darwin had talked about survival of fittest amongst lower animal forms, you know, that the fittest will survive and they'll reproduce, etc. Huxley drew the natural conclusion that survival of the fittest, the logical conclusion that survival of the fittest, means survival of the fittest people. If you're strong enough to take control and, and take things from other people, then that's part of the evolutionary process. Well, Huxley was called Darwin's bulldog. Richard Dawkins has been called Darwin's Rottweiler. <laughs> because he is so adamant in this kind of thing. Um, there's an organization in England, for instance, called the Truth in Science Organization that advocates the teaching of creationism, and we have this in the U.S. too, of course. The, the, not the same foundation, it, this is a British foundation, Truth in Science, that says that creationism, scientific creationism, is a legitimate theory, and it ought to be taught in schools as well, along with evolutionary science. Well, that is so much 
contrary to what Dawkins believes, he has invested a small fortune of his own money to counter truth in science by, by going to every school, because truth in science, they provide literature in schools and DVDs, etc. Well, he, count, he matches them tit for tat in terms of he is himself paying for materials to give to all the schools that Truth for Science is working in because he's, he's declared them to be an educational scandal. And he is so against any idea that creationism should be considered that he's prepared to spend his own fairly sizable fortune at this point to keep any ground being made for the people who believe in, in a religious explanation for creation. Um, he has said that his opposition to religion is really twofold. One, as several of these guys have said, he believes that religion is the source of conflict. And second, he believes that since it is, it, it, it is belief without justification, it is therefore immoral. And so anything, believing in anything without sufficient justification, he believes is immoral and must be fought like any other immorality. Um, so those are the big things that he focuses on. He identifies himself and is in support of the movement called the Bright Movement. Are you familiar with that? There are a number of names that atheists have given themselves. One of them is free thinkers. We have a free thinkers group here in Ahihik that meets, um, and they have ads in the paper and everything. Well, in Britain, they have what are called brights. Daniel Dennett is an American who supported that idea over here. Um, but Dawkins, the idea, they, they found a word that they thought indicated that not believing in God, believing in science, believing in naturalism, to being completely secular, is actually the sign of someone being bright. So they call themselves Brights, usually with a capital B. And he is a big and big advocate of that uh, in England, Dawkins is. Dawkins has campaigned actively, even politically, to keep children from being assigned any sort of religious title, for instance, to say, you know, Muslim children or Christian children, you know, he said, you don't say Marxist children, that it is inappropriate, and he's, he's fought politically to cause this, that it is considered, you know, we no longer say Negro children, for instance, and he believes this is worse than that. So any religious affiliation that is assigned to children especially, he says that children should not be classified according to their parents' beliefs. In fact, they should not be classified at all until they get old enough to decide for themselves. Um, that I mentioned the fact that he felt that it was necessary to try to create an environment where atheists were free to come out to declare their atheism, and so he has led campaigns. There was an atheist bus campaign in 2008 that he helped sponsor in, in London. And the, the sign said, um, there is no God, enjoy your life. <laughs> and that's sort of the theme they think. Uh, he has been involved in written controversy with literary critic Terry Eagleton, theologian Alistair uh, McGrath, whose books are really good, um, and the scientific philosopher Michael Roos. A number of people, including those people, have accused Dawkins of being, first, of fundamentally misunderstanding and misrepresenting the theological arguments he's claiming to disagree with. But also, all four of these guys have been accused of being fundamentalists, <laughs> that they are fundamentalists for their own viewpoint. As opposed to being a Christian fundamentalist or a Muslim fundamentalist, they are atheist fundamentalists. And they, they like an Islamic fundamentalist, will not be happy until everyone is forced to agree with them. And so they obviously don't like that. They don't like it when they're labeled fundamentalists, but this has become fairly common. People, even who agree with them, do not like the approach they're taking. Even people who are acknowledged, stated atheists themselves, who before the New Atheist Movement, have said, you people are mean. <laughs> <laughs> and you need to stop. You're not helping. Eventually, there's going to be a backlash against this. But that's very much where they're coming from. Okay, so Dawkins is one of the strongest anti-religious guys, most uh, militant. We actually watched the latest episode of Good Wife the other night. Did you see it? Yeah, was it him? No, it wasn't him. In fact, he comes on there and he says, she said, she's sort of having these... Imaginary. imaginary scenes in her mind, the, the main character is. And her daughter has become a Christian, and she's not. And so she wants to encourage her daughter to make her own choices, but she can't agree, like, to pray or whatever. And so she's sitting there, having, imagining things, and 
this guy's standing there with a proper British accent, and he's telling her, no, you shouldn't have to believe that other guy. She goes, who are you? And he says, I'm Richard Dawkins, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I turned to Carol and said, that's not Richard Dawkins. So she actually looked it up on her phone real found, quick. Found the photo. Found the photo. And yeah. the guy looked a little like that, but it wasn't no, Richard he, Dawkins. I think he had a beard and everything. Yeah, well. Um, so the, the, but Dawkins is probably above doing a, you know, a cameo in a TV show in the United States. So. The other person is Christopher Hitchens. In some ways, Hitchens has been one of the most popular with the, the, the general public because he was well known as a writer, um, particularly a journalistic writer, a polemicist, a debater. He has contributed to virtually every, every national, and inter, uh, national in terms of British and international magazine you can think of. He's written for the New Statesman, Nation, The Atlantic, The London Review of Books, The Times Literary Supplement, Vanity Fair, etc., 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 on and on and on. Um, and he's very well known. Now he is, he's, he, yes? What is a polemicist? Um, someone who argues against something. Oh. You know, and in fact, some people have said that Hitchens was more than just a polemicist, he was a contrarian. Give him any point and he'll argue with you against it. Um, and so he, particularly in American politics, um, he has written adamantly against Bill Clinton, against Henry Kissinger, he wrote against Mother Teresa. <laughs> Um, he, he's had, and some of these involve whole books. Um, in fact, the book on Bill Clinton that he wrote was called Triangulation of Deceit, Running Out of People to Lie to. That was the name of his book. <laughs> and the, the strange thing is, he, um, he's a very close friend of Salman Rushdie's. And so when Rushdie wrote the Satanic Verses and they put out a fatwa to, for him to be killed, and he had to go into hiding, um, I think that significantly influences Christopher Hitchens' um, opinion against Islam. Uh, as he didn't like religion before, but that really locked it in. To the extent that he was critical of George W. Bush's failure to act more quickly after 9-11. He believed that there should be a military response. Now, he's a liberal of all liberals, and yet when he started saying Bush needs to declare war and what's wrong with him and he needs to go after it, you know, using very, some, and people started saying he's actually a neocon, you know, neocon, a neoconservative. And he then had, he sort of defended himself against that and he says, I, did, I insist on the right to, to believe whatever I want about anything without being labeled about it. Mm -hmm. So he very much was hard to nail down on stuff. He was a supporter of Ralph Nader because he didn't like any of the other political candidates when Nader was running for president. He's a socialist and a Marxist, at least he has been throughout his adult life, and then later on he said, I am no longer a socialist, but I am still a Marxist. And everybody went, what exactly does that mean? But he is the guy, more because he's a political commentator, as well as social commentator, as well as a religious critic, because he is an atheist, of course. Um, he's the one that has appeared on more, more TV talk shows, more debates, been on more platforms, and that sort of thing. So that's why I say he is, in, in some ways, he's more of a populist. He's not a college professor like at Hox, Oxford, like Dawkins is. And so in many ways, he is more of a populist and, and relates to people more. Although his ideas are um, pretty, pretty radical. He, he, at one point, for instance, uh, called someone to ask him when he was on a, a radio program, what, um, what is the axis of evil? This was after George W. Bush talked about the axis of evil. And Hitchens said the three Abrahamic religions, Christianity, <laughs> Judaism, and Islam. That's the axis of evil. So he is, he is strong, he was strongly anti-Christian as well. In writing his book, God is Not Great, which was nominated for a National Book Award. He wrote in 2006, it was nominated for a National Book Award in 2007. So these are popular books. Um, he wrote there that organized religion is, and I quote, the main source of hatred in the world, violent, irrational, intolerant, allied to racism, tribalism, and bigotry, invested in ignorance and hostile to free inquiry, contemptuous of women, and coercive toward children. And that, accordingly, it ought to have a great deal on its conscience. Right? That's his view of monotheistic religion, especially Christianity. He called for a new enlightenment. That, that Europe especially needed a new enlightenment, and that enlightenment would be a freeing of itself from religious belief. Um, 
the, it's very interesting that his younger brother, younger by two and a half years, I think, is a Christian, also a writer. Um, the two of them had had a huge falling out at one point because um, his, his younger brother wrote, he quoted Christopher as having said he would be happy, remember he's a Marxist, he would be very happy if the Soviet army was watering their horses at the fountain in Herndon in Britain. <laughs> And when he wrote that, of course, that people did not respond well to that. And so um, Christopher Hitchens cut off relationships with, with his younger brother. And they were completely non-communicative for many, many years. And then later on, um, when Christopher Hitchens was diagnosed with esophageal cancer, uh, they sort of reconciled. They appeared together on a number of, um, a number of different programs. And declared that they, you know, they made peace with each other, and they were brothers, and they loved each other, and everything else. But still, they were diametrically opposed in terms of their beliefs. But after they were reconciled, Hitchens, Christopher Hitchens, was very quick to say his brother was, you know, was a brilliant guy and a great writer. And in, in, in fact, he would say he was probably a better writer than I am. Um, and so, I think a lot of people, Christians, sort of had the hope that maybe his brother had a sufficient influence on him before he died. So. Yeah. So here's the first two, the British guys. Yes. Where do they believe you go after you die? They don't. You go to the. You, you just go oh, away. Turn to dirt. Okay. You're, you know, worm food was probably what they would say. Okay. That, that's you die. It's over. Okay. Um, this, the other two guys. Um, actually, let's take a break right now. I'll come back and we'll look at Daniel Dennett and Harris and then how I think we should respond to this. So Dawkins and Hitchens are the two British advocates of the new atheism, the two of the four, four horsemen of the non-apocalypse, uh, as they, they were referred to at a conference, and that has stuck. The other two are Americans, Daniel Dennett and Samuel Harris. So let's talk about them for a few minutes. Dennett is not really like Santa Claus, even though he sort of looks at it. Um, Dennett is the only one of these four who is actually a trained philosopher. Um, his, he is, you'll notice here, American philosopher, cognitive scientist, and evolutionary biologist. His philosophy focuses on philosophy of the mind, philosophy of science, and philosophy of biology, particularly as how those fields relate to evolutionary biology and cognitive sciences. So his focus is on the mind and on evolution, but his training is in the philosophies of those things. Um, he wrote two books, Breaking the Spell, Religion as a Natural Phenomena. Again, he and Harris are two of the ones that have especially written on trying to explain how religious beliefs get caught. You know, Dawkins talked about the means. They sort of picked that up. And in fact, uh, Daniel Dennett is responsible for creating what's considered a discipline now called memetics, based upon Dawkins's word meme, which is the study of how these social values and mores and things get, get passed on from people to people as though it were contracting a disease. But interestingly enough, Dawkins, who invented the word meme and created the initial sort of theoretical foundation, does not subscribe to memetics. In fact, he has distanced himself from that. Daniel Dennett is one of the primary advocates for that now um, because that's his field, you know, how the mind works and how society communicates, uh, that sort of thing. Um, in Darwin's Dangerous Idea, his second fam famous book, he talked about how he believes, and Sam Harris has written on this too, how he believes that evolution accounts for the origin of morality. He rejects the idea of um, ethics being in some sort of free-floating realm. Um, he believes that there is, there is bound up in the evolutionary necessity, as they would talk about it, a, a desire for moral values because they believe that is necessary for survival. Again, this is something that Christians have been writing about for a long time and said, yeah, but we can give you all sorts of examples where survival, that people, because of they want to do what's right or what is good, they do things that seem absolutely contrary to survival. And especially when, when you, if you follow Dawkins's idea, which Dennett did, that this goes all the way down to the genetic level, that the genes are trying to survive. The idea that, okay, I'm going to throw my genes on a hand grenade in order to save these other people it really doesn't wash at that point, because if the genes are driven from an evolutionary point of view to survive, that doesn't seem to take into account other people's genes and that they might be more important than mine. The thing does not connect there, I don't believe. Yes? 
Do you know whether they say anything about morality in other animals um, besides humans? I don't. I don't Is it think because if it's important for survival, you'd think that we'd see it elsewhere. Well, I, I'm not aware of anyone. I can't specifically quote them. That's why I said I need to read the material more. I'm not aware of anyone, anywhere, any time attributing moral values to any creatures other than humans. We talked about that last week. That, that morality is a uniquely human thing. Animals do not make decisions, nor are they ever evaluated based upon whether something is moral or not. You know, you don't say... That would, that would help their argument, you'd think, if, if they saw it. And, you know, why would, why would it animals would, be moral? If they could see morality as being part of the evolutionary process of others. Um, I'm not aware of how they've addressed that, but again, no no one ever says, that dog is raping that other dog! You know, you, it, it's not, we don't think of it that way. There is never a moral evaluation applied to any creatures other than people, by anybody. So, I don't know how they address that. You would think if, it were an evolu if they were identifying morality as an evolutionary thing, that it would be true not only for people. It would be true for genes as well. It would be true for genes as well. Yes, people wearing genes. <laughs> um, so, I mentioned to you already that he is, uh, Dennett has done a lot of research into clergymen, clerics, who are secretly atheists, and to try to get them to come out and to provide support for them. The foundation is actually to provide counseling and encouragement and even financial support for clerics to come out and declare their atheism so that they don't lose their livelihood. Anybody who's a minister of the church, of any kind of church, who is prepared to lie about what they believe in order to be able to continue to get paid for it, has got a serious moral problem anyway. You know, I, I would say that's true not just of clergy, but of any kind of job. If you fundamentally knew you were lying every, you know, every day because of, and yet you were continuing to take the paycheck, there's a moral problem there. So, what's that? I said, your house is beautiful, we'll sell it. <laughs> we'll buy all uh, yes. <laughs> On a more serious note. <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> Forgot. I mean, You'll think of it in a minute. Uh, he actually talks about the fact that there, uh, Dana talks about the fact there has been a don't ask, don't tell conspiracy in amongst clergy people. And that given the opportunity, he thinks many of them, all of the thinking ones, Dana would say, would renounce their faith in favor of atheism. I, I, I came you remember back. it. came back. Um, it may have started out with a sincere belief, but over the years, as things have gone contrary, and they felt, I don't know if I believe, I don't think I believe, you know, type of thing, just right. like other jobs, psychiatrists have a highest rate of suicide of, of all occupations because of what they're dealing with all the time. You know, they, they'd be the most sound, so. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's, it, the pressures of being in ministry, you know, there's a lot of things. You can get burned out. Um, and people do lose their faith. There's no question about that. And so I can see that. But the, the proposal that he had to set up a foundation because he believes the majority of thinking clergy people, if they were just given the freedom, they would renounce any yeah. faith. His numbers are awful. Yeah, I think so. Joan. So he has a lot of takers. Well, a lot of it's confidential because he says they don't want to come out. But the, he does have people responding to the foundation. Um, I mean, there are, there are denominations that I know, the Methodist Church, for instance, I know they had a movement to try to deal with people within their, their ministry body, the, the clergy, that were beginning to question their own faith. So it's not unheard of. And, and there are, he's not alone in that. It's just, again, he takes the next step in saying, if they were given the freedom, and they're being honest, they would all say, I don't believe this anymore. Um, so, we'll see. So that's Dennett, the American. Uh, and again, not only the only trained philosopher, but one of the ones who is, who probably is most sort of serious about this stuff. You know, you get Harris and uh, Hitchens said things for, like saying the axis of evil was the monotheist, the Abrahamic religions. Um, he would say things for effect, it felt like. Um, you get Dawkins and Harris will say huge inflammatory things um, as well. 
Dennett, while he says things we wouldn't agree with, tends to be a little more academic, a little bit more somber about this stuff, not quite as throw gasoline on the fire kind of person as the other three, right? Um, Sam Harris, he's the one that sort of historically started the, the new atheist movement, even though there was a lot of talk about this in 2004 when he published the first of his books, The End of Faith. It was, it was a response to the 9-11 attack. Then over the next couple of years he published two more books, all of whom, all of which have been bestsellers to one degree or another, Letter to a Christian Nation. What happened is he wrote The End of Faith and he got so much response against it. Now it was on the New York Times bestseller list for 33 weeks. He got so much response against this premise of religion being the source of evil, all religion being the source of all evil, in The End of Faith that he then responded um, with the book, Letter to a Christian Nation. And in, in that, he was sort of responding to people and saying, here's why you don't like this idea, but it's just because you, you know, you're having a visceral reaction when in fact you can't defend it. And then he wrote The Moral Landscape. The Moral Landscape was his effort to try to deal with where morality comes from. Um, a number of commentators have accused Harris more than the other three of being um, anti or intolerant of religions, especially Muslims, because he sort of launched the, the, the visible part of the New Atheism movement with his book on the end of faith, which was particularly oriented toward Islam being a source of evil and suffering and violence. Uh, he's been accused of aggression and intolerance against Muslims, um, of advocating ethnic profiling of Muslims, um, a lot of other accusations along that line. The interesting thing is there are several other, not these four, but several other very visible uh, atheists, part of the New Atheist Movement, who are themselves from a Muslim background. Uh, for instance, Ibn Warak wrote a book called Why I Am Not a Muslim, and probably the f if you had a fifth horseman or f horsewoman of the non-apocalypse, it would be Ayan Hirsi Ali, who is a woman, came from a Muslim background, she was from Somalia, well, coming from Somalia would be enough to turn you off of whatever was going on there. Uh, the, the most uh, disrupted country in the world. There has been no active, no reasonable government there for 20 years now. Um, so, she, coming out of that background, she, some people call her the fourth horsewoman of the non-apocalypse. Um, she was involved in the production of a movie called Submission with a friend of hers, Theo Van Gogh, which was an anti-Muslim documentary and Theo Van Gogh was killed, was murdered. And they left a note pinned to his chest saying they were coming after her next. Well, she immigrated to the United States. She was in Britain prior to that. She immigrated to the United States. I'm sorry, from the Netherlands. She immigrated to the United States and still lives here, mostly in hiding. You know, where she lives is secret, but she's visible, you know, she goes out for, for talks and things. Um, there are a number of others, Jerry Goyne, Greta Christina, uh, Victor Stanger, I mentioned earlier, wrote a book called The New Atheism. Michael Shermer, who I've seen some interviews with Shermer. Shermer is the, the president of the American Skeptics Association. They have a, a magazine called Skeptic. And he's really not impressive uh, when you hear him talk. He seems so nervous. I, and I'm listening to him speak, and I've, heard, I've seen him in, in, on video a couple of times. Um, you get the feeling that he knows there's something wrong. Uh, is the sense that I get from him. So there are a number of others of these kind of people. But these four are the ones that you will hear about all the time. They're the ones that you need to know about because they're the ones that are really setting the pace. They're not the only people who are considered part of this new atheist movement, but they're the ones that really established it and are carrying the torch, the four horsemen of the non-apocalypse. Okay. Hitchens' work is still being published, um, and even though he died four years ago. So, so how do we respond to the new atheists? First, and I'm not, I'm not going to get into all the details here because I'd be doing the whole past seven weeks of class, but when they say God does not exist, that it is possible to demonstrate his non-existence either by the illogicality of the three O God, that God can't be omnipotent, omnipotent, and omniscient, um, or that God as a hypothesis can be disproven? Well, how many different arguments for the existence of God have we talked about? Logical, um, you know, very reasoned, that go back 
more than a thousand years, the logical arguments for these things. The moral argument, ontological argument, teleological argument, um, the fine-tuning argument, the Caleb cosmological argument, etc., etc. All of these different arguments. It's not just one thing. There are a lot of different approaches to this. You will remember that Peter Kreeft on his website has 20 different arguments for the existence of God. And so when they say, well, the, you know, the, the God hypothesis can be clearly demonstrated as not being true, you go, wait a minute. I'll give you 20 reasons why I believe it is true. And it's not just us thinking that. Again, one of the problems is that a lot of Christians who aren't taking an apologetics class, who have not made the effort to think about this, they say, well, gosh, Dawkins is a professor at Oxford. Dennett is a PhD in philosophy of the mind. How can we argue with these guys? Well, they can still be wrong. And we need not be cowed by that because we believe we are on the right of the one who is eternal and all-powerful, okay? So we know the arguments for God's existence, and that's how we respond to that. When they say naturalism is the only thing that makes sense and it's the only that explains everything, we would say naturalism is insufficient to explain everything we observe in the universe. All of the fine-tuning stuff, remember, they have to make up theories to explain how that is, how that, is. that all of these more than 200 specific physical realities, all of which are necessary for human life to exist, and they all all very finely tuned. Um, they can't explain that by accident. I don't care whether you call them a blind watchmaker or whatever. The design is too specific to not be intentional. Um, the existence of morality. They have not done anything to really demonstrate that morality is a matter of evolutionary survival. They simply haven't. And when you talk about any of these other, in, uh, these other human intangibles, like honor, love, trust, creativity, all the things which human beings have uniquely in all of the animal world that we believe make us in the image of God. These are the ways those and others are how it is we are made in the image of God. There is no other explanation. Human beings are not just another animal, which is what naturalism says. There are too many ways in which we are fundamentally different than any other mammal or any other creature that exists. We are different in kind, not just in degree. It's not like we have a higher level of appreciation for honor, that we have a greater tendency to trust. And you could say, well, my dog trusts me. Well, it's like people say, well, I came home and my dog knew he had done something wrong. He was feeling really guilty. No, as much as I love dogs. Our dog knows that he did something he might get punished for. That's not the same as feeling that you have done something immoral or wrong. Okay. It's not that we just have you know, the creativity in a greater degree than other creatures. There are many, and that's just a few that I popped off the top of my head, so many different ways in which we are different in kind, not in degree, and that is not explicable from a purely naturalistic point of view if we say that we are simply the most evolved of animals. You don't get there from other animals. All right? We need to be able to say why we believe the Christian faith and theism in general is rational and logical. Some of that comes back to the logical arguments. Again, for the existence of God, etc. For morality, they say it's irrational, it's illogical. One of the things that the new atheists are most often accused of is simply not correctly representing what Christian, especially Christian, theological beliefs are. Um, they define faith as irrational belief in, in the absence of evidence. Well, we believe there is evidence, and we believe it's not irrational to believe in that. Um, the fact that they want to put everything in terms of a verifiability, scientific verifiability, is itself not scientifically verifiable. And so at the outset, we can say that their scientism approach, that science is the only way to know truth, does not support itself. It is inherently contradictory. It has its own built-in defeater. You can't prove scientifically that scientism is true. So how can you tell me that that's right and we're not? When we openly say that the fundamental, the most fundamental aspects of our faith are just that, they are faith. We believe that there is a lot of rational, uh, intelligent, logical reasons to believe what we believe, but at the final step, it is faith. 
A.W. Tozer said, Faith rests upon the character of God, not upon the demonstration of laboratory or logic. Our faith is not in a scientific experiment. Our faith is in the person of God. All right? Just like a person's faith in their mother or the aircraft airline pilot who's flying the plane that you're in, there's a point at which you have to say, I am going to accept this. Um, otherwise, you'll never fly on a plane. You'll, you know, never kiss your mother. What? <laughs> Human nature is such that we insist upon having certain things that we accept in faith. Not everything is scientifically verifiable. Um, we believe that, a, that theism, theism is a belief in God, a God, and that Christianity especially has been responsible for much of the good in human history and that religion is not the cause of most wars and suffering, as they say it is. People are always saying that thing, well, religion's been responsible for all the wars in the world. That's simply wrong. <laughs> it's not true. People quote these sort of facts because somebody told them that. If you go online and look up the most destructive wars in history, you will get way down the list before you come to a war which even purported to have a religious motivation, which was the Thirty Years' War. But the Thirty Years' War was much more about political control of land in Europe than it was about religious beliefs. And you can say, well, look at all the violence in Northern Ireland between the Protestants and the Catholics. The issue there was who was going to have the power to control the vote. If the Protestant minority in Northern Ireland, if the British pulled out and left them alone, they were afraid the Catholics would control all the politics. It wasn't a religious difference, really. It was a political difference. They weren't fighting over doctrine. They were fighting over who's in charge. And that's almost always the case. It is not religion that creates wars. Quite often, when you look at things like uh, ISIL, you know, the Islamic State, or other the, the events of 9-11, people will assign a religious motivation for that because that gets them off the hook. I'm doing this as an act of faith, as an act of dedication to Allah or to, you know, whatever. David Koresh did that with the Branch Davidians. Jim Jones did that when he convinced what, 900 people to commit suicide in the, in the jungle in Guyana. People are always prepared to use a religious excuse that is not the same thing as religion being the thing that really motivated that. And it's naive to think that it is. I don't think any legitimate historian would look at any of the ma these major events down through history even the Thirty Years' War or anything else, Northern Ireland or even the events at 9-11, and say it really was religion that was at the core root of that. That was just the label they put on it to make it acceptable to them and to their select group. In that regard, when Sam Harris started this whole new atheism thing in 2004 with his book, uh, The End of Faith, based upon 9-11, he completely got it wrong thinking that it was religion that had caused that. It wasn't. That was just the excuse they used. Not that I feel strongly about this. Marvin? No. Do they ever take a minute to think, is there anything good that's ever come from any religion? Well, they insist that there's not anything good. That, that, that everything is, that anything that you claim is good is superficial and there really is evil underneath it. So from the schools and the hospitals to the communities to... They would, they would say... The Mormons making, making uh, Utah into a <laughs> place that people could actually... They school. would say that schools were, you know, and hospitals, etc. were just sort of subversive efforts to try to influence people's opinions and minds. You bring the kids in as children, you convince them, you know, that, that these value systems, this religious belief is right, it's all evil. Why we believe in the reliability of Scripture? Why do we believe the Bible is reliable? We've talked about all of that, that there, there are many, many, many times more ancient manuscripts as part of the Bible than any other document, and they are far closer to the original writing than any other ancient document. The fact that it is so significant in terms of a, a major feature in people's lives, and it has been for 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years, um, we believe that there is significant evidence for the truth of the miracles and of the resurrection. If you heard my sermon on the resurrection, and we, if not, you can go back and listen to it, where I went through, here are all the reasons why we believe this really happened. And, and it is not reasonable, it is not logical, it is not rational 
to say, well, this just couldn't have happened without considering the real evidence and what that seemed to tell us. We need to be prepared to say why we believe and insist that religious belief is not going away. All right, Voltaire said it was going away, and starting in the 20th century, the Geneva Bible Society was printing Bibles on Voltaire's printing press in his, you know, in his old yeah. workshop. And he insisted the Bible would be gone, religion would be gone within 100 years. Um, these guys still saying, it's just a matter of time, we're going to do away with this, we need to actively be involved in doing away with religion, and it's going to happen, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's, people have been saying that for a long, long time. It is not going to happen. And we believe, and this is Reformed epistemology, if you remember that word, those terms, we believe that the, the perception of the divine, in other words, that the ability to see God, to experience God, even though, even though our vision may not always be clear, we see through a glass darkly, as Paul said, that it is properly basic for people to be able to perceive and relate to God as much as it is properly basic for people to be able to see with their eyes, hear with their ears, taste with their tongue, etc. That it is an inherent sense that all people have. And if someone doesn't have it, it's because they have a disability. If someone can't see, we call it blindness. If they can't hear, we call it deafness. We don't have a word for it. Maybe the word is new atheism. When somebody has, they are disabled and unable to perceive as a properly basic sense that God exists. Because as Psalm 14 says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Now, a lot of people have been critical of these guys. The Catholic Church has consistently said, you know, you're picking on us. And Christopher Hitchens said, well, anytime religion gets criticized in Britain, the Catholic Church is gonna get more than its share of it because they are, you know, the major Christian religious group. But even atheists, before the new atheism, have a problem with the militant, aggressive kind of approach they take. Even atheists have accused the new atheists of being fundamentalists, that they really are religious fundamentalists, only their religion is secularism. That they are as extreme in their beliefs as Islamic fundamentalists are. In fact, one, uh, one writer identified similarities between new atheism and fundamentalist Christianity, and concluded that the all-consuming nature of both of them was, quote, endless, encouraging endless conflict without progress between the extremes. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not talking about evangelical Christianity, but, but fundamentalist Christianity. Um, they're accused of being um, anti-Islam, as well as being anti-Christian and anti-Jewish, etc. Pretty much everybody has a problem with it, even other atheists. Other scientists are saying, you're using our discipline to try to beat people over the head with it. And even if they, even if they might agree with some of the scientific conclusions that, say, Dawkins, as an uh, evolutionary ethnobiologist, would say, he is using that as a weapon. And other people in that discipline would say, you shouldn't be doing that. That's not the way our science is supposed to be used. So pretty much everybody has had problems with this, but yet they're still very popular. And unfortunately, people think they're really smart. There's um, one of the books that I have read about them, which is a fascinating read. It's Daniel, called The Atheist Delusion. Um, he's got like three names, Daniel Hart Bentley, Daniel Bentley Hart. I think it's Daniel Bentley Hart. Um, the Atheist Delusion, and this guy, I don't know his other work, but this guy is really smart, and you should read how he takes these guys to town as being of, you know, he would say, of modest intellect and poor literary ability. Um, he's rough, isn't he, Carol? Oh, We've read smart. that book. He yeah. just scathing on these guys. Um, and so there are people, very sharp people. Now, this guy, Daniel Bentley Hart, is, is more willing to get militant on their backsides, whereas most people, like the William Lane Craig's has debated uh, these guys, has debated Hitchens, um, or Alistair McGrath. Uh, these are evangelical theologians, philosophers, people of significant academic credibility, and they have debated these guys, they've written against them. They tend to be very kind, you know, because First Peter says, be always prepared, be prepared to give a an explanation of the hope that is in you, but do so with kindness and gentleness. Well, this Daniel Bentley Hart decided not to be kind or gentle because he doesn't think they deserve it, and he rakes them. 
But, and in doing so, he gives specific examples and quotes and things in which he, is, he says, here's an example of the poor thinking they do. Um, there was another article I read recently that said, you know, when, when Dawkins starts doing philosophy, he's really bad at it. Okay? And so it's not like these guys are so smart, they got everything figured out, but a lot of people don't recognize that. But we have to. Questions? Comments? Chris? Um, the memes thing? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the premises is you have to be able to prove everything, right? Like, have they, this jumping thing? Like, so they would say, well, the evidence is there. In fact, one of the things Dawkins was involved in a conversation once, and they said, but you know, you don't have evidence you, you, for evolution, for example. And of course, he sees genetic evolution as being the biological part, mimetics, or the mean transfer as being the social part. Um, and they said, but you know, how, did, how can you prove this? And he says, well, we see the results of these things, even though we don't see it while it's happening. And he used the analogy, and again, I always want to be fair. He used the analogy. He said, it's like a detective comes upon a murder scene. They didn't see the murder happening, but they've got all the evidence, and their job is to follow it up and try to determine what happened there. He said, that's kind of how we find ourselves. But he admits they, they don't actually see it happening. They are drawing conclusions from what they believe the appearances are. Well, other people look at the same evidence and go, uh, you're not reading that right. It's like I, uh, we have a game called Consulting Detective. It's a Sherlock Holmes game. And you read, it gives you a scenario, and then you ask questions, etc., and you try to figure out who did it. Well, I had uh, two friends of mine I used to play this game with. And one of them, we would be doing this, and, and he would sit back and go, well, obviously, and he would draw out this big explanation for what he thought happened, and the other two of us would be looking at him going, what are you talking about? Where are you getting this stuff? There's nothing like that that you could draw. And it was just like his mind was creating this stuff, and to him it sounded reasonable. But we would point out, there's no evidence for that in the materials we have here. Well, I think that's exactly what these guys are doing. You know, they're drawing out these scenarios as possibles, and it goes from possible to probable to absolutely true over a period of iterations. I think that's what you find, even though they admit, no, we've never seen evolution happen. We've never seen the transferal of memes. We've never seen genes acting in this sort of intentional, aggressive, self-preserving -preser evolutionary uh, movement. But we see the evidence for it, and so therefore we believe it's true. In fact, we know it's true. It's got to be true. It's absolutely true. Anybody who says it's not is a stupid idiot. I mean, that's the way they talk. Um, I don't think I'm making that up. <laughs> so I do think that we need to have some more familiarity with their work. I confess that I've not read enough of their original stuff, and I need to do that more. So I, I give you that qualifier. Uh, but I've read enough of their stuff in quotation and then you know articles and things like that that I'm really not impressed. Any other questions or comments? Anyone? Yes, Joan. Assuming that the new atheists could envision a world where they had won their argument and people didn't believe in God anymore. Exactly what kind of world would that be like? I mean, I'm thinking if, for example, um, my, my genes reproduce themselves is the most important thing to me, and the next most important thing to me would be other people like me having genes that reproduce themselves. That, that wouldn't do much for interracial understanding. I, I should be, when I'm in Africa, making sure that nobody there gets a chance to reproduce. I'd be an idiot to be a street child or educate somebody. Right. Um, unless they're a lot like me. Right. right. Well, you're drawing the logical conclusions, yeah. which like T.H. Exley, at least you can give him credit that when he, did, when he applied survival of the fittest to the human race, at least he was being honest. These guys are not prepared to go that far, although, Critics of them will say that what you're suggesting, if we really tried to do this stuff, it would be a nightmare. You know, that's what I'm just wondering. I mean, after all the sound and fury and arguing and these uh, unproven hypotheses, I mean, an unproven hypothesis is just a hypothesis, and there's billions of hypotheses that have been right. proven wrong, right? 
So it's just an idea to be through it. Yep. But even, even without all of that, assuming they got what they wanted, what could you do with that? You know? Well, they feel like that would then, and I'm, I'm reading into them a little bit here, they believe if you got rid of religious belief, got rid of anything that's not scientifically verifiable, mm -hmm. so that science, a naturalistic, secular, scientific approach to life was there, that would clear the way for human excellence to then flourish. Would this be the same science that brought us the Adam Ball, landmines, eugenics? Yeah. Uh, they feel that, you know, they would say, well, that's all misguided ethical stuff that's all really religiously based. You know, it's pe people go people go in that direction because they were products of a religious. Whereas, if they were cleared of all of that, then they would be much more oriented toward the survival of the species rather than the survival of their particular, you know, uh, uh, scheme of things or particular religious beliefs, particularly. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, yeah, it's I, again, I'm, I'm putting words in their mouth, and that's not really very kind of me, but I think that's how they would respond to that. So the idea of what would, what a horrible world it would be if we lost all of that, they would say, oh, no, no, that will clear the deck so that we then can excel for the right reasons, and that is because the human potential would be there without being suppressed by all of these religious, uh, ethical kinds of falsehoods. Hmm. Hmm. So are they looking for a world populated by a superior race and no other race because the other race like the average person, is unable to survive due to their gene pool just not being... Well, they, they wouldn't say that. No, T.H. Huxley would say that. He's been dead a long time. Um, they wouldn't say that because of the unpopularity but, uh, of that since the Second World War, yes. for instance, um, and the, the death of the whole eugenics movement. You know, there were... You still hear these stories about... It was a period of time in the United States when there were active people actively pursuing sterilization of any women who were in mental institutions. Mm -hmm. There, there was a kid that went to school and she was sterilized because she yep. was considered mentally uh, unfit. Exactly, and so we we've had in our own country we've had that kind of thing, but that's no longer considered something you can say out loud because that's associated with the eugenics movement that got discredited. Uh, with Hitler in the Second World War and the Nazi experimentation and all that kind of stuff. So they won't say that, but that is the natural, logical progression of what it is they are saying. Um, and yes. that's because we believe in the fall. You know, they, I think that they believe that people are potentially wonderful. Right. Um, that there is the potential for perfection yeah, on our own terms, not because there is some God. That's the, you know, clearing the decks for human excellence, the, the, and, the development of all the human potential. And maybe part of it is they're naively believing that everybody is like them already because they're in their little academic environments or, yeah. or you know, some of them aren't necessarily academics, but they, the, they only hang with the people who are like them, and so right. they think everybody's going to be like well, them. Well, and these guys have become, these four especially, become like demagogues. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, held, they're on pedestals like crazy probably loving it. But um, you, know, you don't get a lot of humility from them, in other words, mm -mm. because humility is the antithesis of what they're representing. You're not militantly anti your opponents in the way they are if you've got any sense of humility at all. And so they don't, uh, and they would consider that counterproductive. You know, they believe in intolerance to people who disagree with them. But that's not humility. There's no humility found in that. And so they they would say, yeah, you, we got to destroy this religious thing. Then humanity would have the potential for becoming all that it can be, and uh, and the cream will rise to the top. Now you remember last week when we were talking about um, I don't remember the context of it, the fellow who received the Texas Science Scientist of the Year award. He's an um, <coughs> an ecologist and ecology scientist. And he said that humanity was responsible for so much destruction of the, of the planet, the only way the planet would survive is to reduce the human population by 90%, and he had a plan for doing that. Airborne <laughs> Ebola. And he would be right. These guys, you know, they would probably, they're smart enough and they know what people will buy, you now because they're good at it, enough that they probably wouldn't come right out and say, oh, yes, I think he's right. But they probably would be right there with him. You know, that in... in 
We just need to pick the 10% smartest people, which by definition means people who don't have any religious beliefs, and put them someplace isolated and right. turn loose the Ebola. Release the Ebola, yes. I just saw a movie. The whole premise was to get rid of 90% of the world. Mm -hmm. Then it, hit, they, it happens to be one in which somebody said, this movie's really good, you better go see it, it's really action packed, and I went for that reason. But the whole thing was uh, based on a crazy man whose premise was, I'm going to destroy 90% of the world and you know, we'll start all over. Yep. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the James Bond movies was about that. You know. um, anyway, that's where we find ourselves. Have these people, any of these four, written about um, population uh, overload and, and all the things that are happening to the universe? Or Not that I know of. Um, Dennett would be the one most likely to do that because he deals more in those kind of areas, but I don't know. Again, I can't, cannot claim to be an, a real expert on their writing. Pardon? And somehow, perhaps magically, once they get rid of all the religious people, things like greed will disappear, mm -hmm. dishonesty, laziness, yeah. and so on, which are not fruitful. Because they know for sure that all those things are a product of religious belief. Yeah. So they'll go away with religion, probably. Yeah. Thank you all very much. I will see you next week.